Well, this is going to get interesting. <laughs> Um, well, I've got a tale to tell. Unfortunately, I don't have the same artistic director that John had, um, so we're going to have to just do it with words. Um, the setting for this tale is the Boise River Basin. Um, it has three major uh, watersheds in it, three major reservoirs. I got a pointer, guys? Oh, here it is. Thanks. Um, where are we here? Okay, we've got um, below Moores Creek is the Lucky Peak Reservoir. Um, beneath Twin Springs, we run into Arrow Rock. And then where most of the scene will take place is in the Featherville Basin over here, uh, which drains into the Anderson Ranch Reservoir. Um, downstream from all of this over in here is about 15 kilometers downstream from the lowest dam sits the city of Boise, Idaho. And so our tale of two years is based around these two characters, Water Year 12 and 14. Um, this is from a snow tail site in the upper basin. And really, they're two average looking Joes, so to speak. You can't see the means on there yet, but you'll see it in our next slide. This is from a little bit lower in the basin, uh, where I do have the means and uh, medium precipitation, I should say, plotted up there. And again, you can see 12 and 14 looking like pretty average Joes, in fact, struggling to be an average one. Especially take a look at water year 2012. That's going to be our main culprit in this tale, and that's the one in kind of the goldish yellow hue. Right in here, we have a little forebear of what was to come, um, a midwinter melt event um, that indicates the snowpack was very warm at this point and just kind of laying prone to the whims of any potential future energy inputs, just sitting there prone to melt. Um, this is kind of our damsel in distress, saint of circumstance, or as one might say, just a pawn in the game of climate change. But this was an indicator that this year was going to be anything but average. This is stream flow coming out of the Featherville gauge. Um, I guess I can't say this is an observation based on Alan's talk this morning, but an estimation of stream flow uh, from the USGS. And I've got the 70-year median in there in magenta, and you can see the strong flows coming out of this basin even before the traditional peak of snowmelt runoff. In fact, about two-thirds of the annual water yield went through this weir um, before the traditional peak of snowmelt. Well, if this was Vegas and everything that happened up in Featherville stayed in Featherville and water didn't flow downhill as it does primarily in Idaho, um, there wouldn't be much of a story, but it does. And the same thing was going on in the other two basins and all this water was headed into the reservoir system and headed down to the nice folks down in Boise, Idaho. Well, this put water managers um, on the edge of their beds in the wee mornings of the hours wondering what to do. Um, I apologize for that little thing over there. That's some cryptic language that some of the characters in this tale still use. Um, but basically, that's a flow metric. Just look at the graph, never mind the uh, units. And you can see how much water they were flushing through this system very early in the season on what was an average snow year. Um, 8,000 CFS is bank full stage along the Boise River. Anything more than that, and they start affecting homes and infrastructure. So here they were pushing as every drop they could out of the reservoir system, anticipating what they felt was going to be even future snowmelt inputs as the season continued. Um, this is a quote um, from Ron Abramovich in the local paper. And since this is a tale, I apologize to Ron. I know he's not here, but anybody who works with him, I should have redacted his name to protect the innocent. Um, pretty much saying, and he went on in this article to say, we don't have models that are really capable of handling what we're seeing. Um, and just kind of throwing his arms up in the air of, we need help. This is kind of akin to the scene in Gotham City when the uh, chief of police and the commissioner look at each other and say, it's time to hit the bat phone. We need help. Let's get Batman into this. And then here's just a comparison again to uh, water year 14 here, water year 12 is up there, and you can see the drastically different flow regimes um, that came through the city of Boise. So the pre-wise police commissioner in this case is the Department of Interior, the Bureau of Reclamation. 
Um, the Batman they went seeking are my colleagues at the Agricultural Research Service Office, Northwest Watershed Research Center in Boise. And they came looking um, to try to develop better tools. Is there a better way to handle what they were seeing in the past and, and what they anticipate happening in the future? Um, we're currently just completed the second year of this project. The first year I kind of presented some of the stuff here last year on was can we operate a high resolution, one hour time step, physically based model in the Boise River Basin and do this with a turnaround time um, that was compatible for the operational water managers in the basin. This past year we coupled the snow model to a hydrologic model to see if we can do accurate hind casts of stream flow. And in the coming year, we're looking to ingest short-term weather forecasts so that we can give them short-term predictions to help out these water managers um, deal with what are non-normal conditions. Um, the idea here was that I was going to, let me see what my next slide is. Oh, here we go. Sorry about that. So iSnowball has been mentioned before. It's a physically based snow model. Um, the main interest we have here is the surface water input. Um, that's going to be coupled to its partner in the next slide here for the hydrologic modeling, in which we use DHSVM um, to route that, those surface water inputs. The surface water inputs include snow melt, um, rain on bare ground, and rain percolating through a saturated snowpack. The modification that we did to couple this was to kind of eliminate um, the precipitation from DHSVM, do the snow modeling on top of that. And some might ask, and I know there's plenty here from the University of Washington, well, there's a perfectly suitable snow model in DHSVM, very similar in some aspects to iSnowball. Why did you take it out? And our reasoning there was that iSnowball, A, can handle blowing snow redistribution, and it gave us a lot more freedom to distribute the point observations that we had. Um, the way ice, the framework of ice snowball is set up, you're pretty much free to do whatever you want to distribute the forcing variables. So that gave us a lot more flexibility. Taking a look again at those flows um, that were observed, um, what I came here to present was and what our philosophy was in this short time span of let's take the model, let's take a look at the normal year 2014 tweak whatever we need to in the model, do some tuning of the uh, hydrologic model where we could, get the model best tuned to 14, and then throw it at 12 and see how we do. Um, that was the idea. But AGU deadlines came up in our face. Um, we couldn't quite get 2014 exactly where we wanted to, and hence we initialized the first model run for 2012 as soon as I heard the words, we have now reached our cruising altitude, you are free to turn on your electronic devices on my flight over here. Um, so what I'm trying to say is what you're about to see are some very early work, um, and we hope to refine some of this, but it'll give you an idea of what we're capable of. So let's concentrate on the bottom right there. That's the normal year, 2014. Um, and you can see we're doing a very good job, we think, on the stream flow, um, except down here in the latter part of the year, we seem to be lacking some snow, perhaps in the upper basin. Um, in a couple of talks yesterday, we saw that that certainly could be the case when you don't have representative precipitation measurements. Maybe it's the distribution mechanism. We haven't really vetted out what exactly it is yet, and so we're not going to place it right there. It could be many other factors. Ran into the same issue in 2012, but the really neat thing is we did pick up all this early season uh, runoff events up in the basin. And so this is a very promising uh, result, we feel, and we look forward to re refining some of our modeling here and do even better in the coming year. So some things we learned along the way, um, some of this is obvious. Um, the complex model, the physically based model, is robust to extremes, um, but it's a little bit cumbersome. Uh, long run times, I've pretty much been walking around with terabytes of data in my backpack for the last four weeks. Um, and it's difficult, if not impossible, to perform ensemble runs, which are necessary to get some error estimates on these deterministic values we're currently outputting. Um, it also makes it difficult to calibrate this hydrologic model using something like a glue framework. And then there's also the questions of forcing data, um, the representativeness and the quality of it. And so at this point, 
Brace yourselves, folks. You're probably wondering what's on the other side of this slide. To what many of my friends and closest colleagues would call the dark side. John, did you get that subliminal message? It's to try to ease you through what you're about to see in the next few slides. What exists on the other side, the dark side? So in my work now with WSL and SLF, I've got to take a peek under the hood of the latest advances in a simplified model. Not quite simplified, but maybe not so complex. Um, and we know that these types of models would struggle with non-normal conditions, but the advantages are the, the quick run times. Um, they're conducive to formulating calibrations. Um, and you can do these ensembles of model runs that are conducive to data assimilation techniques uh, and so on. And so now I'm going to show you some uh, recent stuff that we've put out at SLF. This is from an enhanced temperature index model with ensemble Kalman filtered data assimilation. First, the enhancements to the temperature index model. It's got a seasonally varying melt factor. It accounts for liquid water in a snowpack as a proxy for was your snowpack warm or is it cold, how susceptible it is to melt. Um, there's another formula in there, the partition uh, liquid and solid precipitation, as well as some subgrid sub -grid, um, topographic variability that could be fed into the model. Um, the ensemble Kalman filter was introduced by Slater and Clark. Um, it's a strong data assimilation technique, and what this has the advantage of is when your temperature index model or simplified model kind of starts veering off course, it gives you a means to come back to what reality is. And this is a little bit more difficult to uh, bring into a fully physically based model where you want to update all the states in the model. In this particular um, graph, there's 15 years of bi-monthly measured um, snow, manually measured snow, um, plotted against what uh, the model said was there. So we are using meteorological inputs from these stations in the model run, but not the SWE data. And you can see that we're getting a pretty good sense of what is on the ground. And to really do an accurate hydrologic forecast, you need two things. You really need to know what is there on the ground right now before you can hope to give any sense of what's going to happen in the future. So you need to know what's there now, and then you need to have some robust tools to handle what's going to come in in the future. So right now we're seeing we're doing a very good job of getting what's there now, an important component of getting an accurate hydrologic prediction. These are some other um, products that we've been producing. A lot of the water managers like to know what's happening this year and what year is it similar to, because they've kind of got this photographic memory of, oh, I remember 2002. If this is like 2002, I remember exactly what happened. So they want things like this. But it's also important to have some spatial information for them. This is just from last week, where in this basin, just slightly below the long-term average, but when you get spatially explicit information, you can see, well, there's really no snow on the ground, and it's well below average at the lower elevations, and above average at the higher elevations. This is very difficult to do with a, a physically-based model that's very labor-intensive. Well, you could get all the old model runs in there, but what happens when you come up with a fabulous new distribution technique for precipitation? What happens when you come up with a better way to partition liquid and solid phases of precipitation? You then, to do these accurate comparisons to previous years, need to go back and rerun all your model runs, which is a cumbersome task that I wouldn't want to throw on any graduate student. And so the point I'm trying to make is it's not really a black and white situation right now. Um, we will continue to develop those physically based models because some of the problems that we're finding with them in that um, computational times and storage is probably going to disappear in the next 10 years or so. So we need to continue pushing those along. But right now, water managers need better tools to make decisions now. And right now, I propose that we need something in between. Um, we certainly could use some of these more flexible tools to get us a better idea of what's on the ground. But certainly, when we're looking forward, we need uh, tools that are robust to non-normalities. So I'm putting forward that right now where we stand, I think all of us need to use whatever we got in our tool belt and bring it together um, so that when we're faced with these dire consequences, um, our water managers are best suited to handle them. Thanks for putting up with me. I hope I didn't violate any codes of conduct in the new AGU policy. <laughs> Thanks, Adam.
So uh, we, we do not have time for questions. We can have one very quick one, if there is, or uh, catch uh, Adam right after um, the session. Is there one? Okay. Thanks, Adam.